And we, uh, who would like to read, please? I think Rose read last week. I vote for Gladys. Yeah, Gladys, please. We're right here. Antigonus. Excuse me, Rabbi, does the Hebrew text start with Kabadim or is there a line before that? Uh, we're right here. Antigonus? He's... No, no, no we, we can only see Kabadim. Oh, Kabadim. Ka 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 oh, I'm, so I'm sorry. Like this? Yeah, that's better. Okay, there we go. I can actually make it a little bit bigger. Is this better? No, we lost the Hebrew. No, we, we lost the Hebrew part. Okay. Like, it was okay before. We lost the Hebrew part. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I think Gladys is on mute. Maybe she doesn't know she's mute. Uh, let me see. Okay, you want me to read in Hebrew? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Antignas ish soho kibel. Mishimon Hatzadik, who haya Omer, Alti Hyuka Avadim Hamisham Shim et Harab Almanat Lekabel Pras, Ella Havuka Avadim. I lost you. Sorry. Ella Havuka Avadim Hamisham Shim et Harab, Shelo Almanat Lekabel Pras, Vehib. Morei Shamayim Alechem. Beautiful. Yossi. No, you, you know, maybe in the English. Let's see the English. Anybody wants to read the English? Uh, Albert? All right. Antigonus, a man of Socho, or Soho, I don't know how to pronounce it, yeah. received, received the old tradition from Shimon the Righteous. He used to say, do not be like servants who serve the master in the expectation of receiving a reward, but be like servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving a reward. And let the fear of heaven be upon you. Great. Okay, so let's see, let's, 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 uh, let's see a little bit about this Mishnah, what exactly we're learning from here. Um, so what do we understand here from, there's a few statements here from, from, uh, uh, from Rabbi, uh, from, uh, from um, Isoho, from this great sage. And we have learning here that uh, something that would be called, let's say, the ultimate way of serving God. So as we did in the previous classes, let's first of all speak a little bit about Antigonus, because I think that, the, first of all, the name is quite striking here. Antigonus lived, um, as we, 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 we uh, finished off in last week, we were speaking about Shimon the Righteous, Shimon at Sadiq, and his best student, let's put it this way, was Antigonus. Uh, he lived in the first half of the third century BCE. Um, he's the first noted sage with a Greek name, if you notice this name, Antigonus, it's such a Greek name, uh, probably a very popular one uh, at the time of the Talmud. Um, so this is maybe a reflection of the rising influence of Hellenism inside the Jewish community because we are talking about a time where uh, it's right around the, the, a few years, uh, maybe a, not a few years, I should say a few uh, centuries before the whole story of Hanukkah, where there's a great influence, Greek influence in Judea and in Israel uh, and the entire of Israel. So the use of the Greek, of the Greek name is striking. Uh, it shows that, it maybe shows us also that the sages did not simply reject Greek culture, uh, they also learned from it. Uh, they filtered the messages so that uh, only those teachings compatible with Torah culture would be would get through. So that's the first thing I wanted to bring out is just by already the name, uh, it's quite striking to see. Uh, Antigonus was the leading disciple of Shimon Atzadik, as I, I've just uh, mentioned, uh, and he was the Jewish people's new Torah leader. Uh, and he lived, so why is he called Ish Soho? 
He's the man of Soho. Soho was a region in Judea. So if we would have to say uh, Antigonus was from the city of Soho, was what, that, that was in Judea at the time. So the Mishnah, I want to I wanna draw your attention to something different that we've seen in the previous Mishnayot, in the, the first ones. So we, we saw that Moshe kibel Torah misinai umasra. If you recall, the first Mishnah and the second Mishnah uses the term masra. Moshe kibel Torah misinai umasra leishua. So masra meaning handed down, right? Here we don't see that the term is used. What do we say here? We say Antigonos, a man of Soho, received. So there's, there's quite some things to say about that because uh, all the generation before that from Moshe handed down to the law to Yeshua from whom it would pass to the elders then the elders to the prophet and eventually the prophets to the men of great assembly. Each instance we are told that, that the law was handed down or handed over. Uh, and this is important because it might seem like superfluous or of non-importance but it, it is quite important to, to, to state that because a precedent, we see that through the generation, a precedent, a precious heritage uh, was handed down to be preserved. In each instance, the receivers has become the guardians of the law by explicit appointment of their elders, meaning from Moshe became the guardian, uh, Yeshua, Joshua, and from Joshua to the elders, and to the elders, and so on. Uh, as distinct from these, Antigonos, uh, and we'll see all those who followed him, were just members of a group of disciples who studied at the feet of their masters and received the oral tradition as they listened to uh, the learned discourses. And I'm drawing this attention because here, the word that's used is not handed down, but received. Um, why is that? Since, because they, they were acknowledged to be the most capable and proficient scholars in the group. Um, although these men were eventually chosen by their elders, um, uh, I'm sorry, were not chosen by their elders, but they were con contemporaries uh, to teachers and leaders of the nation uh, that the elders passed on. So what's, what's interesting is that here, Antigonos is only viewed as a receiver and not someone that actually handed down. He's not part of those sages of Moshe, not the same category as Moses, Joshua, the elders, the men of great assembly, which were considered as mesora, as handing over, but more as a disciple that would receive and obviously pass it on to his students but not in the same category as Moses and, and Joshua and all the elders. So I thought that that was kind of an interesting point to see uh, the difference between the first Mishnah and the second one. Now, it seems that uh, the teaching of, uh, of uh, Antigonus is somewhat of a paradigm shift between what was accepted at the time. Um, so if we were to look at his teaching, what is he basically saying? He's saying that God and religion should not be viewed as a vending machine in which you insert worship and obedience to get the good things in life. Now, it is possible, and I'm putting it in an in, in historical context, it is possible that Antigonus was impressed by the Hellenistic philosophical critique that, that said that everyday religionists are in, are in it only for the payoff. Uh, so that was a very Hellenistic idea that, that, that philosoph philosophers at that time, we could see it in, even in Aristotle and, and, and Plato and so uh, Socrates is writing that, you know, they said that people follow religions because, they, you know, basically they want to get their payoff. Um, and according to them, it, it constituted a primitive religious position. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Antigonos wanted Judaism to be 
a religion practice at the highest level of religious motivation. Um, so the reason why I said that this was kind of like a paradigm shift is that the sages believed specifically at that time that the renewed self-limitation of God, which spelled the end of visible miracles and prophecy, came from God's desire that humans take a higher level of responsibility in their covenant process. Meaning, if you recall, we, again, it, it's very important to put everything in, into context, into the historical context. We are at a time where there's no more prophecy, as we see through, through the handing down of, 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 of religion and precepts and, and ethicals. There's no more prophecy. There's no more miracles, at least not visible ones. Uh, by the time Antigonos comes into the arena and, the, and all, the, all the sages that follow him. So the sages believe that this was a time of renewed, um, uh, of, of, of kind of like God saying, look, until this time, you guys had the temple. You know, you went through the desert, you came into the land of Israel, I gave you a beautiful temple, you built this temple. At the temple, you had prophets, you had these great kings, King David, King Solomon, King, all the great kings and all the great prophets that were at that time. And now, because of whatever reason, the temple was taken away from you. We're talking at a time where there's no more temple. And even at the time after, when there's a great, the, the, the demands of great assembly, when there were still prophets, all of this is gone. So you could look at it as something really, oh, it's terrible. There's no more temple. There's no more. But at the same time, there's a kind of like a twist and a positive point for it because it seems that we're going on a higher level of responsibility. Until this, time, until this time, everything is handed over to us. We go to the temple, we see the Kohanim, we see the great people, we see the prophets, and we're inspired. We're easily inspired. Now that there's no more temple, there's no more prophets, there's no visible, visible miracles, here we're asked to, uh, to be worthy of this, to be worthy of, 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 of the responsibility of the confidence that God gave us. To be worthy of this, individuals should shift their religious psychology from a focus of reward and punishment for doing or not doing God's biting to a state of being motivated by one's relationship with God and a desire to do good for its own sake. And this was, I think, a very strong emphasis at the time where um, where uh, uh, Antigonos, at, at, at this specific time in history, Antigonos was, was uh, the leader of the sages, which as we said, could have been influenced also from, from Hellenistic uh, uh, ideas. Um, is, 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 this, is there any questions on this or should I? Should I are we good? Okay, I think well, we're going to get into a lot of the details of the the um, a lot of the details of the Mishnah in, in just a few seconds. But this is really a, a, a little bit of an introduction. So let's see that the Mishnah is really telling us also to keep our eyes on the price. The mission contains probably the most basic important concept in Judaism. Uh, one which the Rambam viewed as uh, perhaps the most important concept. Um, although the Torah, and this is quite, and I, I was hoping that maybe somebody will kind of jump off of their chair and say, well, Rabbi, what are you talking about? The, the Torah speaks about reward through the whole, through the whole Bible. We, we, we learn about this whole idea of reward and being rewarded for our, for our deeds and everything. So, what does that mean that now Antigonus is telling us, you know, work, no reward, don't expect anything. So although the Torah promises rewards for those who fulfill the commandments, 
one who constantly performs mitzvah to receive a reward. By you frozen. Oh, I'm sorry. Where, where, where did I freeze? We, you were cut off. Just back up a bit. Okay, so, so the whole idea of keeping think... your eyes on the prize, you did catch. And the fact that the Rambam says that, um, you know, the most important concept here, we learned the most basic concept in Judaism, that although the Torah does promise reward for those who fulfill the commandments, one who constantly performs mitzvot to receive a reward is not acting in an ideal manner. The reward is for the person who cannot see the innate, innate innate wisdom in performing a mitzvah totally out of love. Like let's say, uh, like a servant who only works for an allowance, this person has a shallow relationship with his master. This is really the idea that is conveyed here. Yes, it's true that the Torah does speak about reward, but to, is, is my, whole, my whole point of, of of serving God, of doing, of, of doing whatever I could do to get closer to Him or do certain, certain actions is only for the reward or because I understand that what is God is asking of me as performing, of doing something or acting ethical and, uh, ethically and, and morally is actually a means in itself. So are the actual act of goodness and kindness that I do are only for the reward, they're only a means to an end, or they're an end to himself. And, and we learn from Antigonus, from his teaching, that we should view that the Torah and the mitzvot as an end to themselves, not, as, not as a re, only as a reward. The Rambam says something like, yes, there is reward in the Torah. We see it in many places, but just do what you have to do. And so far, he says, the reward will come at the end. But that's not the purpose. That's not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is understanding how being an ethical person and a moral person and acting morally and, and behaving and doing good deeds should be as an end to itself and not only a means to an end. Uh, sorry. Rabbi, yes, I have please. a question. Yes. Does that mean that uh, does that mean that all the teachings before Antigonus were wrong? Because they they kept on saying if you follow, then you will be rewarded. So all of that is wrong. That was done no. wrong. Well, well, not 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 so much wrong. Uh, but um, it shifted in terms of the 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 load or 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 the amount of responsibility that we had. When, let, let's put it this way: when you came to the Beta Mikdash, I, I, for me it's very hard to imagine. I'll tell you the truth: we don't live really in in in, in, a, in a generation that we can even conceive what it is to be at the temple or to be, to, to, to walk into the temple in Jerusalem to, to see the, the Kohen. But let's, let's try to imagine. The whole concept of coming to the Bet HaMikdash was, there's not much praying going on. Uh, Torah is very limited in, in the fact that there's not too many texts. You know, the, the printing, printing was invented maybe 500, 600 years ago. So we're talking about over a few thousand years ago. So the service was, our service to God was, was very much emphasized you coming to the temple when you needed something. You needed to, you needed to cleanse your sins. You wanted to bring an offering to God. The, the whole service of God was around coming to the temple, bringing an offering because you, you wanted something from God. You know, you, you, you brought an offering and you expected by bringing this offering that God should give you certain things and God should, should do this. So the whole emphasis is around that part of our service. Now, when that's taking away the emphasis, because the source of our, 
our our emuna of our belief came from the froze again rabbi i'm sorry because the source of our belief came from the temple itself you keep on freezing oh am i okay let me let me see if i could go to uh, You guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let's see if I can move somewhere where I have a little bit better reception. Go in the vineyard. <laughs> a nice breeze coming from the vineyard, right? Take us for a tour of your vineyard. It seems to follow you wherever you go. Yeah, you see that? <laughs> it's great. It, it's a portable vineyard. <laughs> you want some wine? <laughs> okay. is, is this better? I think it's a little bit better now. I think I have a little bit ba very bandaged here. Um, Okay, so uh, I don't know where, I, where you, you stop. So basically around the temple, it's not that it was, it was wrong. It was that the reality, that was the reality of, of maybe what God expected from us at that time. Uh, God is the one that asked us to build a temple. So around the temple, this is what was going on. A, a, a sort of like a maybe a vending machine at the time where coming to the temple and, and, and bringing your offering and asking to be uh, asking for, from God certain things, etc., etc. Once that, that was taken away, and, and I would say that the inspiration, the Jewish inspiration of that time was the temple. Everything was around the temple. Torah was around the temple. The service was around the temple. Whole Judaism was just around the temple. Now, when that's taking, the problem with, with that, so to speak, is that everything is handed to you. And, and this was, if, if you look at historically, God takes us out of Egypt. Did we marry? What does, what does it say over there? Did we actually marry for it historically? This says, no, we, we actually didn't have it, so many married. So God kind of takes us out. He, he drags us through the desert, he brings us to the land, and he gives us the, everything, the, the, the wealth of the land, and he gives us the temple, and he's constantly present in our life. The, you would come to the temple and you would see this all great thing. So everything comes from him. When everything comes from above, the problem with that is that you don't appreciate it, right? It's, it's just like with your children. When you just constantly give your children and you give them and you give them, at one point, you realize, wow, they're, they're really not appreciating what I'm doing for them. When you're starting to educate them and tell them, look, you know, I'm not going to give you everything you want. I'll give you what you need. And if you want to get also what you want, you're going to have to kind of work a little bit for it. You'll have to do this. And if you get a good grades and, you, and if you do this and if you do that, I'll give you everything else, everything else you want, right? How does that song go? You can't always get what you want, right? But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. So, so that was really what was going on at the time of the temple. God is just giving. Take, 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 everything. At one point, he sees, look, I'm giving you all this stuff, and you guys are really messing it up. You guys are not behaving properly. There's a problem with this guy. There's a problem with this. The king was not a judge. The kings that were around at the time of the temple were not righteous kings. They're making all kinds of messes, and there's wars, and there's politics. Okay, this has to stop. And now you have to work for your own things. You're going to have to actually come forward and find me. Until this time, I just 
brought myself to you, you will have to now find me. And, and, and I think this is where it shifted completely, not from above, but from below, from a human effort, not from the effort that comes from God himself, but comes from our own effort and our own work. And I think that that's where it shifted, not because it was wrong or it was right, but because that's, that's the way God presented it. And God says, okay, enough is enough. I've been a good, good, I've been a good dad for a while. Now you guys have to work a little bit. So I think it's no, you're going to have to work with, with no temple. You're going to have to work on your own. I think it's, um, yeah. I think it's a very good ideal. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, they say it's better to give than to get. Uh, there's, you know, there, there's different sayings like that. And I think actually, um, well, I mean, throughout time, there were people, that, you know, m many people that, uh, that felt, you know, uh, you know, that, that lived by the ideal of, you know, I'm going to do good. I'm going to help. I'm going to be generous for the sake of doing that to make me feel more fulfilled in my life. And to help those around me and a lot of those kind of people are you know are blessed as a result of it even though that that's not what they were looking for and i think right now the uh the 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 younger generations the millennial and 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 younger than the millennial are becoming um are are are, are believing in that a lot more as as a generation than say the generations prior to that were they were maybe more uh, you know more after making the the you know money and the the dot com era and all of this stuff now people uh, you know want to feel like they're helping make the world a better place 100%. and uh, so I think it's I think in that sense it's it's you know we're coming back to this point uh, you know uh, more and more as as a society. Yes, uh, definitely. We, we see that it's a lot more pertinent uh, today. And, and we see that, and, 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 and you mentioned about, I, I was talking about it with someone about uh, when he was, he's probably in his 40s now. And he was telling me, you know, Rabbi, when I was, when, when I was young, half of, uh, at least eight out of 10 of us all wanted to be entrepreneurs and we wanted to, we wanted the big houses and the big money and everything. He says, today, the young guys, everything shifted. They want to spend time with their family. They want to do the right thing. They want to, they, it's not that the other guys, they want to spend time with their family, but I think it shifted completely. The mindset completely changed. People want to work a little bit less. They want to make, they don't care making a little bit less money, whatever it is, but they, they, they want to do exactly as you mentioned. They want to be part of something much bigger and giving more than just taking from society. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. Thank you very much for that. That's a very good point. And I think it's very pertinent. Uh, uh, so obviously when we, when we speak about here, um, we're calling someone a, a servant here, a Eved, what we see in, in the actual text that's used. But, um, but there's, there's an Eved, everybody, I would say, Everybody that has employees would would really, you know, employees is not something that's easy. Uh, to, to, good employees is not something very very easy to get. Uh, but here, I think the term "evid" is not so much as a as, as a "evid" because a "evid" literally translated in Hebrew is a slave. You know, we we translate it a little bit more, a bit more uh, in a mild milder way as being a servant, but. I think here the, the term leshamesh al tiyu keavadim meshamshim that serve um, it comes from the word sharet in Hebrew, which implies personal ministrations to a master. That means that you know it, it could it could be readily presumed that there's they do exist a servant or an employee if uh, if they have to uh, they have to uh, if they have the, the good fortune to be called upon to render personal services to their employer, derive much pleasures from their personal contact with their master or their employer, that they regarded as sufficient reward, right? And itself, 
and have uh, no thought of any other compensation. And I think, I mean, it's, it's a very high level of, of, uh, of uh, service where the actual in pleasure that we seek, according to, to this, this idea, according to Antigonos here, the pleasure that we seek is not, mo not so much the material uh, pleasure that we receive from the, from the employer from, from this part, from here. It's gone from the master, but it's more a pleasure of just becoming close to him. Uh, the fact that we, we have this opportunity to do something good and that God gives us this opportunity to get close to him through our good deeds. Because, you know, sometimes we're not, able, we're not always thinking about it, but when we give tzedakah, you know, that's great what you did. It's, it's an amazing thing. But there's an element that we sometimes forget. While giving tzedakah, at that moment, you just became closer to God. You know, we don't always think about it this way, but, but any action that we do, any good deed that we fulfill in our life, as much as it makes us feel good for doing good for others and, and, we're, and we could see that we're doing good things, at the same time, there's something that is happening between your relationship with him, with you and God, that every single action, everything you do, you get closer to him and you kind of invite him into your own personal life. And, and by doing so, uh, that shows the great pleasure you have and not so much of what you'll get from him, but more of what, uh, uh, not what you'll get from him, uh, uh, material wise but the fact that you're getting close to him and, and that's something that uh, we see here from the wording of the mishnah mesharet leshamesh meaning that uh, your your happiness and your your fulfillment is from the fact that you're actually doing something for 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 god and for 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 other people and that's the real joy uh, that 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 one derives by doing a good action, or at least this is what he should aspire for. Um, now, what's love got to do with it? I think that's also a song, no? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we see here in the Mishnah that that we. Uh, that obviously one, one who performs the mitzvot out of love um, can also achieve a much greater closeness to God, as I just mentioned, right? For, right, because he doesn't expect anything. Now, do we also, um, if we go to the second part of the Mishnah, I, I, I don't have it in front of me again, but I'll read it. I, I can share the screen right here with you right now. Let me see. And the second part. Okay, so we got the idea. The idea is to serve, you know, serve Hashem in our best of abilities and not expect anything back and just do good because for the sake of good, because we recognize that it's the, it's the right thing to do. But then at the end, uh, at the end, he tells us, Antigonos tells us, um, and let the fear of heaven be upon you. So let me just go back to the phrase. Do not be like servants who serve the master in the ex expectation of receiving a reward, but be like servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving a reward, and let the fear of heaven be upon you. So what? Why, what, what is this whole idea of fear now? Why does that come into play? So far, it's beautiful, it's amazing, loving God, being a loving person, doing good things, amazing. I understand it. I actually appreciate it. But now you're telling me love, I'm sorry? Now we're telling me that love is not enough? Now I have to fear? Why fear? What is this whole idea of a fearing God? Of, of, I have to be afraid of him? What is this idea? So let's see, let's understand it in the simple way, and then we'll give an example of why is it that uh, the fear of God here, and, and we'll talk about the fear. Where, we're not talking about fear where we fear this 
ultimate God with a big, you know, that he's going to punish us and he's just waiting for us to around the corner with a bat to, 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 oh, you did this. That's not the kind of fear we're talking about. That's definitely. If we're talking about fear, we're talking about reverence. Um, so even though Antigonos emphasizes that one should serve God out of love, uh, he finishes his statement by reminding us of the commandment of fear of God. Why? Now, there are times when love will not suffice as a motivating factor for performance of the mitzvot. And I'm just explaining the simple understanding of this Mishnah. The rabbis teach us that love is a strong motivator for the performance of positive commandments, but the fear is a stronger motivator for negative commandments. Now, Atiyagunos, a balanced statement reminds us that we need to have both love and fear of God. Now, why is it so important to have fear of God? What is this idea? So, first of all, some commentators question the sequence um, of Antigono's statement. Because he says, to serve God without consideration of reward is the level of uh, love of God, which is considered a much higher level spiritually than reverence of God. So, just in the order of things, should not this, shouldn't the sequence be reversed? that one proceeds from reverence to love. So, did I make my question clear? I'm not sure if I, if, if I was clear enough on the question. Or did it even sound like a question? Initially, Rabbi, you said it's not a question of reward and punishment. Yes. Or a carrot and a stick concept. I, yes. I, I tend to agree with you. But what I don't understand is what then is it trying to say here? What, the second part or you're, you're saying the... No, I, you were saying initially that it's not a reward punishment situation. It's not a carrot and stick situation. Yep. It's something else. And you started talking about the something else, but that I didn't catch. Oh, so, so the, the, when we finished off, we, we explained that we do good for the sake of good. Right. Do good for the sake of good. Reward will come later. In order to build a healthy relationship with God, it's not about so much what you're going to get. It's not about you. All, it's not only about us. It's about doing the right thing. You feel that being the, a good person is the right thing to do. Do it. And after that, reward will come. Fine, reward will come. I'll take it with, with pleasure. But that's not the whole purpose. The ultimate purpose is much greater than that. Now comes, comes the second statement when, when Antino, Antigonus finishes off, and this is what throws, throws us off. According to Judaism, the ultimate, the high level of spirituality is serving God out of love, just like we explain now. Serving him because for the sake of good. And reward comes whenever it comes. The lower level is out of fear. I fear God. I'm afraid that he's going to punish me or whatever is going to happen. I, I'm very superstitious or whatever the reason is. And, I, I, and therefore, I do whatever I do in order to not be punished or not, do, do, not, not to receive the wrath of God. Now, that's a much lower level than serving him with love. Sure. Now, so why does... Antigonus at the end says, you know, serve him without reward, with love. You also have that fear. The order should have been reversed. First, if one has to, first of all, question, why do we have to altogether serve God without a fear? First question. Second of all, if we are to say that fear is required, it should come in, it should come in first. As a lower level, fear him out of fear. And eventually, when you're mature enough and you understand the, the divine service, you'll serve him out of love. So why does it go in that order? So, so while this is true in one sense, there is nevertheless a good reason for emphasizing reverence after love. So... I will start by saying that we are definitely not talking about fear 
out of punishment or anything like that. We're talking about reverence. Just like you have reverence to, to, your, to an elder or to, to your father or to, 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 a, to somebody that you have reverence to. So, there is an aphorism that familiarity breeds contempt. What does that mean? And we must be most cautious not to dissipate the attitude of reverence in an intimate relationship. And, and I'll give an example to that. The Torah teaches about uh, this episode where Pharaoh increased the burden on the Israelite slaves after Moses delivered the divine message to set them free. Moses confronted God with after I delivered your message to Pharaoh, you increased the suffering of the Israelites. You did not rescue your people. This is what Moses complains to God. The Talmud states that this bold language indicated a lack of proper reverence to God or for God. And that is, that is, that this was one of the reasons Moses was not permitted to enter the promised land. Now, the intimate relationship Moses had with God should have not detracted from his reverence. This is a very, very important lesson, I think, here, because even in, in relationship between man and, man and his fellow, fellow person, or between even a husband and a wife, it's an interesting parallel to this in the Talmudic statement on how a husband should relate to his wife. It says like this, he should love her as dearly as he loves himself and respect her even more than he respects himself. This is a Talmud, Talmudic statement. Now, the Talmud was aware that even profound love may not preclude offending the wife or the husband with a harsh word or even an insult in a moment of anger, God forbid. Now, it therefore requires that in addition to love, a husband must maintain a high level of respect for his wife. This is the message really that Antigonos is saying at the end of his, uh, at the end of his adash. Whether in the relationship of man to fellow man, man to God, or husband to wife, intimacy should not be permitted to lead to a lack of reverence. Love and respect must go hand in hand. So the idea of, of, of fear here is not so much the fear in God, but out of reverence. When I know when I get close to God, or I, guess I get close to my friend, that familiarity between friends or even between an employer and employee maybe maybe david could maybe david could could brighten us on that when you get too close to one of your employees he feels a little bit too comfortable there's always as a teacher i could say myself i remember my, one of my rabbis when i when i started teaching he told me right before i started my first day he told me remember when you teach you have to be a friend to the students but you have to be aloof. You have to stay a little bit, you know, back, take a step back and remember that you're the teacher and he's the student. As much as you're friendly and you're, 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 you're embracing him and you love him and you shower him with love, you always have to have a certain, I don't like to use the word distant, but to be aloof, right? To understand that the familiarity might take away from this relationship of an employer and employee. And I think that uh, I remember even working in a, as, as, a young, as a young person, when you get too close to your boss, you start losing a little bit of this reverence that you have for him. Yeah, you know, so it's nice to get closer to your employees, but you have to remember that you're the employer and then he is the employee. Right? So I think that's the same idea that, that Antigonos is telling us here. While we get close to Hashem by loving Him and by, by serving Him and doing all these great things, we have to remember that fear, the reverence to Him, has to keep us always on the right track and not become completely 
like Moshe did, re forgetting our reverence, forgetting the reverence and the relationship that we have, we have with Hashem. I, I, is that something? Is that something uh, 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 that you could relate to, David, as as an employer, as 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 a boss? Unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, sorry. The um, yeah, I I don't I don't really feel the you know um, I don't think an employer needs to uh, create a certain amount of sort of a certain level of aloofness, um, but I think generally speaking, there's a natural there's a natural uh, relationship between sort of uh, if you want to say. <laughs> the president of the company and somebody uh, at whatever level of the company. I mean, it could be a, a, a senior manager uh, or an executive, and it could be somebody, uh, you know, working uh, in a warehouse or customer service or whatever it happens to be. I think it's, um, I think there's this sort of natural relationship where they see you as, as the, uh, the ultimate boss. Uh, of the business, uh, and and so there's a, a certain amount of respect that I think you get. That's a given, but then I think uh, it's a matter of you know being empathetic and and humble, and uh, also uh, depending who it is, if, if you know if if it's somebody you're mentoring, you know then like so I I don't think it needs to be necessarily an aloofness, but I think. Uh, I think it is important that there be a distinction that, you know, we're not just friends. I can be friendly with you. I can certainly be respectful with you and, and you with me. Uh, and, you know, you have your role and I have my role and we need to work together in order to be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's uh, that's. Uh, so this, there's one last thing I want to say about the Mishnah, but if we go, before I say this, it's, it, this is a side point a little bit of the Mishnah. Um, as we see, it, there was actually, a, through history, was a negative result uh, in the teaching of, of Antigonus, of some of his students completely misunderstood his statement. Um, but does anybody want to ask a question or, or, or yeah. say a remark? Yes. If I may, Rabbi. Yes, please. I, wonder, I was just wondering, how does that tie in with what the Torah clearly stipulates in one of the parshiot, when the Torah talks about, here is what I expect you to do, all the commandments, the chukim, and here are the rewards if you do them. Yes. And then later on, it says clearly, but if you don't do the things that I've commanded you to do, here are the curses. The, how do you call them? Tochachim? Tochachot, yes. Tochachot. That you even re read at a lower voice in, in Shul. Right. Because they're so bad, they're so terrible. That's the fear right. of God being instilled in people. If you don't follow the commandments that I've given you. So on the one hand, the Torah tells us, do the, the right things I'm asking you to do, and here's what happens to you if you don't do them. And we have this uh, guy saying something different somewhat. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so really that's, that's really what... Um, Guys, I have to, sorry, I have to go. I have a, a call at one o'clock. Okay, David. Good to see you, David. Have a beautiful day. I, I, it was actually, well. I really enjoyed it. Spending my lunch hour with you guys. Thank right, you. Robert. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Yeah. Robert, yeah. So ba basically, um, you know that from uh, from. So I'll answer your 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 question by raising another question and, and and getting back to your to to answering that. So first of all, we, we if I if I may if I may. I'll strengthen your question a little bit. Uh, so you, you gave a very good example from the Torah itself. Uh, and, and there's also a, um, 
a quite striking um, a Gemara, and I'll tell you what it states. And, and there's a famous question, how do we, how can this be re reconciled with the Gemara? The Gemara says, uh, if one says, and we do it all the time, by the way, uh, uh, Albert, uh, when we go up to the Torah, right? We say, okay, Shumit uh, Nadev, whatever, $18, and he wants a refua shalema. And this, right. and this is explicitly brought down in, in the tractate of Rosh Hashanah. If someone states, this coin is to charity so that my son shall live, or, you know, so somebody should hear, or so that uh, I shall marry the, the world to come. The Gemara says, he's a tzadik gamu. He's a righteous person, a completely righteous person. So how does that reconcile with, with what we just saw with, with Antigonus? He just told right. you, you can't do that. You're giving money in order to get something. So the Gemara in Baba Batcha says that for giving tzedakah to the poor, one receives six blessings. And for also saying comforting and encouraging words to the poor, one receives an additional 11 blessings. And the Gemara says, for more important than the actual giving of the tzedakah is the way it is giving. The poor and uh, that have uh, to beg for, for, for alms or are broken and shattered, instead of making them feel that they are not, they are on the receiving end and you are on the giving end, you should convey a sense of gratitude to the poor for giving you the opportunity to do a mitzvah. Um, so that's the receipt of, from the Gemara, but be explained to mean that if while giving charity to a poor man, one says, I am giving this because of the benefit in store for me, to the fulfillment of this mitzvah, my son shall live. It is possible even that he does not have a son. That is just saying to make a poor man feel more comfortable or shall marry to old kakam, such a person in Sadi Gamur, because he makes the recipient feel like a giver. So what, 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 why did I bring this out? It, it seems like it's completely, it, it, it strengthens the opposite, yeah, to the, uh, the opposite, opposite, to what, uh, the opposite what, uh, of what we just said, right? Right, right. So, so really the, the, the answer is, is, and what we've seen in this Gemara, is that it's really in your attention. What is the purpose? It's all about in the kavana. What is your attention? Yes, it's true. And this is what Antigonus is really, really saying. And, and don't get me wrong. You know that two of his students completely misunderstood his statement. And because of him, we had in the Jewish, uh, uh, in, in Judaism, we had the, I don't know if you ever heard about the tzadukim and the baitusim. Uh, there were a sect that there were the students of Antigonus, there is disciples who misinterpreted his teaching um, and uh, perpetuated this error by teaching it to their disciples and their disciple to disciple. And because as a result of this teaching, of this misunderstanding, they completely left the ways of the Torah. Because Those are the, the Sedusim, I think they call them. That's right. Uh, uh, that's right. In Hebrew, it's tzadukim sedusim. They were the student of Antigonus. And because of, and as a result of this teaching and their misunderstanding of Antigonus, they came to a conclusion, well, if there's no reward, there's, there's no creator. Because the Torah, you know, if we don't believe, the whole Torah is speaking about, you know, punishment and reward. It's one of the Jewish principles. So, it's one of the 13 principles that the Rambam himself brings down in Judaism. So how can you come now and tell me, oh, there's, there's no reward. So Antigonus is not saying there's no reward. There is reward. But why are you serving? What is your kavanah? What is the purpose why you're serving God? Is it for the reward? Yes, Antigonus agrees that there's reward. He, he knows about the parasha and the Torah that you quoted, uh, Albert very well quoted. He knows it. He knows that there's reward. He knows that there's, there's punishment, there's tochacha, there's, there's everything in the Torah itself. But 
what is the purpose? What is the kavana? What is the reason why you're actually fulfilling this mitzvot? Is it only to get a reward or not to get punished? Or you're doing it because you want to get close to Hashem? Because you think you know that it's the right thing to do. And by knowing that it's the right thing to do, you're doing it so you can get closer to Him and be part of a greater picture. So Antigonus is telling you, do it, but don't do it only for the re reward will come. I agree with you. And Chaz Shalom the other way around, Tochachot will come also. But don't do it because you want to get reward. Do it because you want to, for, for another reason, do it because you want to get closer to him. You want to have a relationship with him because you love him, because, because of all these beautiful things, except for just having the reward. Because one that only works for a reward, he's not really serving Hashem, he's serving himself in, in, in a way, right? I'm doing it so I can get. That's not called the service of Hashem according to Antigonus. Now, it doesn't mean that it's completely wrong. By the way, the Rambam says, and as we see from the Gemara, if one does that, and he does serve Hashem for reward, he will not get punished. It's still considered completely okay, but it's not the ultimate. The ultimate service is when we serve Hashem because we have the... We want to. Because we want to get close to Him, because we want to serve Him, and because we want to get close to Him. So it's two things, it's both of them. And by the way, you know this whole minag that we give uh, candies in, in the in the in the, in the Beta Knesset, right? When we right. go to synagogue, we give little candies to kids, to children. So the Rambam says it's actually an alakha in the Rambam. The Rambam says we give candies. Well, he doesn't use candies because I guess in his times they didn't have candies like we had. Candies. He says we give almonds and we give snacks to children to come to the synagogue to get them used to come to the, you know, so they should get used to, they like, they enjoy to come to the synagogue. So that's how we get it. So yes, it's, it's something that we do for small children. And, and it's a reward. You come to the synagogue, I'll give you candy. But eventually the Rambam says, as a mature person, you should evolve and understand that you're not just there for the candy, you're there because you want to connect. You're there because, right? We, you and I don't go to the synagogue anymore for the candies. No, we go for the scotch, but that's a different... <laughs> <laughs> scotch, you're allowed to go. For scotch, you're allowed to go. You know? we, have to, we have to beg any hadith. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, so, so... You know, you remind me of one thing, Rabbi... When yeah. I was a kid growing